today we're going to uh, continue with our series on the finished work to open up the new year. And I've entitled it The Unfinished Reformation. But before we get into the word, I'd like us to just bow our heads. Father, we thank you so much for everything that you are, but especially what you've demonstrated through the finished work and what is available to us through your finished work. And Lord, we just pray that we'll get a hold on that and live that out in our lives and see your miracles become reality through us as you work in us and through us to accomplish your purposes because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The story be told of two old men, two old geezers, uh, who'd both been widowed for many years, and uh, they were out walking and talking on Valentine's Day. And the one was an old Irish scudder named Steve, and the other was an old English codger named Roger. And uh, don't be thinking that they'd be related to anyone in this church, or you might be mistaken. But uh, as they were conversing, Roger said to Steve, he said, have you ever wondered, mate, uh, if you would still be able to perform your husbandly duties, were you to remarry at this age? Steve uh, responded, well, I suppose the thought has crossed me mind, but why do you ask, mate? And Roger said, well, it is Valentine's Day, and it just so happens that I have an old friend uh, that I've known for many years, and she happens to be a madam here in town, and I thought she might be able to uh, help us answer that question for free. What do you think, mate? Steve said, well, I do love the word free, so I guess I could follow along. So they show up at the madam's house, and Roger shares their concern. And the madam takes one look at them, and she figures, these guys are both a bit senile. I don't want to waste any of my girls on them. But she does tell her assistant to go up and put an inflated doll in each of their rooms. And then she sends them upstairs. About 20 minutes later, these two old scudders are walking away from the house. And Roger says to Steve, so tell me, mate, uh, what did you learn from your experience? And Steve says, well, your friend didn't do me any favors, mate. Uh, the woman she sent me was either sedated, paralyzed, or totally dead. She never said a word, never moved a muscle, never even made a sound. So finally I just left. What was your experience? Roger said, oh, mate, my experience was much worse than yours. You see, I, I'm afraid my madam friend sent me a witch. A witch, you say, said Steve. What gives you that idea? Well, mate, when I went into the room, I just tried to be a bit friendly and nibble on her earlobe. And the next thing I knew, believe it or not, she broke wind something terrible and literally flew out the window. And I'm sure some of you are thinking that we need to be on the committee to censor the pastor's jokes, but uh, <laughs> there is a point to the story. And that point is that uh, Roger thought he had been bewitched when the truth of the matter was that he was just a bit senile. And uh, the reality, however, is that there are a lot of people who are being bewitched in our world today. And unfortunately, a lot of them are God's professed people. Which takes us to our opening text this morning, which is Galatians 3, verse 1, where Paul says, O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you. Oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? In recent weeks we've been talking about how the New Testament church exploded and grew like mad because it focused on the finished work of Christ and applied Christ's finished work 
to everything they were doing. And how the devil came to realize that this was a huge problem. And that if he didn't deceive God's people somehow, he was going to be in big trouble. So we talked about how from the second century on, the devil basically deceived the church and blinded it to the power of the finished work. But he even started this process in the first century. He started it right in Galatia, with the Galatians, as we can see from the rest of this verse. Paul says, O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you not to obey the truth of the crucified Christ? What is the truth of the crucified Christ? It is the truth of the finished work. He goes on to say in verse 2, Did you receive the Spirit through the works of the flesh under law? Or by faith in Christ? By faith in the finished work. In verse 3 he says, How could you be so foolish to begin with Christ, to begin with the finished work and end up with the law and the flesh. Martin Luther was a great fan of this passage in Galatians 3. In his monumental Luther's works, which go on volume after volume after volume, but in volume 26 of Luther's works on Galatians, he devotes 17 pages alone just to Galatians 3, verse 1. That's how much he's invested in this one verse. He devotes another 14 pages to Galatians 3, verse 2, and on and on it goes. Uh, Luther loved this passage, and you notice I have a signed uh, signature with, in gold of Martin Luther on this book here. Uh, which reminds me uh, of the story of the old New Englander who was uh, living in a house that had been owned by his family for generations. And it started out as a good Christian family, but by the time it had gotten down to his generation, they were a bunch of atheists who knew nothing about the Bible. And this guy uh, was finally cleaning out his attic, and he... Uh, decided to have a yard sale to get rid of all this junk that had accumulated for generations. And uh, his good Christian neighbor came over and said, I see you've got quite a few religious books here. And the man said, yeah, they belong to my family ages ago. Some guy got all excited about some old Bible here, old dusty thing. And the Christian said, well, why was that? I don't know. He said something about it being a Gutenberg Bible. And the Christian just about went insane. He said, a Gutenberg Bible? Do you realize that must have been worth at least a million dollars? And the guy said, no, no, that can't be. It had a bunch of scratchings and writings, some, some bloke named Martin Luther. And it couldn't have been worth oh, too much, you know. But, uh, you know, when we look at what's going on here in Galatians, Luther recognized that Paul was very, very strong in his language. Uh, this could have been translated in Luther's German, uh, O oh, insane, deluded, demonized Galatians. <laughs> Very strong language Paul is using. And when Luther addresses the question, was Paul being too harsh on the believers? He says, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Because Paul recognized that the finished work was the basis of everything in the Christian life. And if that got messed up, if that got compromised, then everything else was compromised. Luther knew that Paul knew that nothing was more important and basic than the finished work of Christ. And that it was essential to keep this in the forefront continually. Really, if you miss out on what the finished work is about, you really cease to be Christian, in Luther's view, and in Paul's view. Because you fall into a works righteousness that's no different than the world, or that's no different than the realm of religion and religiosity in general. 
there are only two systems. There is the finished work of Christ, and there is works righteousness that comes out of the flesh. It comes out of human striving. The Reformation, at its very core, was a rediscovery of the new covenant gospel of grace, the finished work of Christ. And it was a rejection of all the deception that had accumulated in the church since the second century and even before. This on what the Reformation got right. And then I want us to focus on what it lacked. But let's start with what it got right. What it got right was the finished work of Christ for salvation. The finished work of Christ for salvation. Like many of us who grew up under law, Luther took his faith very seriously. Luther started out to be a lawyer. That's what his father wanted, his family, the pressure, the traditions. And Luther was a good student. He was going to be a great lawyer. The only problem was he had an encounter with God in the woods of Germany and uh, dropped out of law school. Felt that God was calling him to be a monk. And not just any monk. This was the most fanatical monkery you can possibly imagine. Luther called himself the monk of all monks. All the other monks thought he was a fanatic. Uh, Luther would lay in the snow naked, doing penance before God, thinking this was important, necessary. He had a bed of nails that he slept on week after week and month after month, doing great physical damage to himself, thinking that this was somehow impressing God. He made a whip, just like the whips used in the Bible to scourge people with the 39 lashes. And he used it on himself, whipping himself as hard as he could, giving himself a full scourging, believing that this was pleasing to God. You know, he focused on every detail of human behavior that he possibly could. Until one day, when he went to Rome, he was crawling up the steps of the Vatican, confessing all of his sins over every step, when he had another epiphany, another encounter with God. And this one came out of Romans 1.17, where the voice of God spoke to him and said, the just shall live by faith. So the legalistic monk of all monks became the greatest advocate of the finished work and the gospel of Jesus Christ that the world of his day had ever seen. I've often thought, and I even preached a sermon called, Thank Goodness for Legalism, because I really believe that the more you grow up under law, the greater appreciation you have for the freedom of the gospel and the power of the finished work of Christ. I don't think it's coincidence that the two greatest exponents of justification by faith, righteousness by faith, the finished work of Christ, came out of the two most legalistic backgrounds you could possibly imagine, the Apostle Paul and Martin Luther. You talk about being law-bound, these guys were as law-bound as you could possibly get. But that should be good news to us, many of us who've grown up under law, because it tells us that we have great potential to be exponents of the gospel, of the finished work of Christ, that we can have an appreciation for this that goes beyond the average person. I really believe it's impossible to have a true assurance of salvation under the old covenant law. I really believe those two things don't go together. Because if you've ever sinned once, the old covenant law condemns you. There's no way out of that. That's what it does. That's why Hebrews 7.11 says, if it were possible for the old covenant law to save anyone, for these sacrifices of goats and rams, for their blood to save anybody, then it wouldn't have been necessary for Jesus to come. It's because that law was inadequate. It's because that law was incapable of saving anybody that Christ had to come, shed his blood, and provide us 
with the finished work of salvation. But yet so many Christians today, and this isn't just in Adventism, it's in so many places, still put themselves under law, still put themselves under the Ten Commandments, still put themselves under that curse, as Paul puts it. The Ten Commandments are called a ministry of death and condemnation. 2 Corinthians 3, 7 to 9. That's what they are. Why would we want to put ourselves under a ministry of death and condemnation? Paul says when you put yourself under this, you curse yourself. You are under a curse. It's a curse that makes it impossible to really understand and appreciate the freedom and the assurance of salvation in Christ alone. Galatians 3.10, you're under a curse, Paul says, when you put yourself under the law. Luther understood this, and he also recognized the church had been deceived for centuries and needed to be free from that deception and that curse. And so he spread the good news of the assurance of salvation through the finished work of Christ alone, and it caught on like wildfire. Millions of people found freedom for the first time in their lives. Many Millions of people found joy. Happy is that people whose God is the Lord. When you're under the finished work of Christ, you are a happy person. That's what the word says. Happy is that people whose God is the Lord because it's good news. What he's done is good news. And it was so much of a task, it was so much of a huge undertaking just to get people to understand how the finished work applied to salvation that that's where Luther put most of his time and energy and writing and work, focusing on the finished work and what it means for our personal salvation. And that was greatly needed. Until you have that assurance, it doesn't make sense to talk about a bunch of other stuff. But hopefully we have that assurance today. And God is calling his bride to, in the context of that assurance, move beyond and apply the finished work to every other aspect of the Christian walk, of the Christian life. And I want to focus on three very important aspects in our remaining time this morning. Number one, the finished work is the key to understanding and embracing the Father's heart of love. Understanding and embracing God's amazing, unconditional love. I really was in full agreement with what Sherry said last week about if we don't get the Father's love, it's really going to be impossible for us to love God or especially to love others, especially to love the unlovely, which scripture calls us to do. It is only when we understand the love of God for us, which is revealed in the cross. It's revealed in the finished work. That's what 1 John 4, 10 says. In this, the love of God is made manifest. Not that we loved him, Not that we loved him, but that he loved us and gave his life for us as a propitiation for our sin through the finished work of his son. Everything comes out of the finished work. Everything comes out of the ultimate expression of who God is, what he is, how much he loves us. And the more we focus on that, that becomes the beginning point of everything else. We talked about how the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Well, the the fear of the Lord can best be translated a the practice of God's presence through the finished work. The finished work is the most basic thing. It's the source of everything else. The practice of the presence and every other good thing comes out of the finished work. Many people... uh, still say, well, you know, I I recognize the finished work, I recognize what God did for us, but I still feel this guilt that I'm not doing enough. I'm I'm a couch potato Christian or whatever. And, uh, you know, there's no question that it is exciting to see people like Wesley and, and Paul 
who were just so passionate about God, they were so on fire for God, that like their ever, every living, breathing moment, they were out there preaching. You know, Wesley rode his horse to five different cities a day and preached in five different cities, got stoned on the way. Uh, the same was true with Paul. He was going through amazing persecutions for the kingdom of God. And, you know, I, I certainly would never depreciate what these guys did. I think it's phenomenal, it's amazing. And they did it for the right reason. They did it out of an understanding of the finished work and the gospel. So it was out of the right motivation. And that's awesome. But what we don't want to do is look at people like that and say, well, you know, I, I'm a totally substandard Christian. God doesn't really love me all that much because after all, I can't measure up to the Apostle Paul. I can't measure up to Wesley. I can't measure up to Luther, these guys who just seem to be fanatical about the kingdom. Um, and, and I don't think it's the right paradigm to think about God's love for us in the context of our behavior or accomplishments. Luther didn't do that. Wesley didn't do that. Paul certainly didn't do that. And it's important that we don't do that. The, the paradigm I like to think of is parenthood. You know, I've got three kids, I love them all dearly. It just so happens that all three of them are on a track right now that thrills me. <laughs> you know, I'm very excited about where each one of them's going and what they believe and their relationship with God. But that hasn't always been the case. You know, one of my kids at one point was at a place that was very scary and very dark. And uh, did that mean that I love this child less? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. If anything, your love for that child even gets more focused when, when you see one of your kids going in a direction that's scary. Um, so when we're God's children, behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. The Father has given unto us that we may be called the sons and daughters of God. When we're his kids, he loves us. He loves us all the same. The more we're struggling, the more we have his attention in terms of his love for us, just being there. And, and, and we need to understand that, that his love for us is just completely 100% poured out upon us all the time. And he doesn't want us doubting that, questioning that, worrying about that, living in guilt uh, concerning that. That's just not who God is. God is our parent. He's our amazing, loving parent who identifies with us in our pain, in our suffering, in our hurting, in our struggling. Whatever we're going through, he's that loving parent who's there for us and with us in that. When it says Jesus lives to make intercession, that's not talking about Jesus being a go-between in a struggle between us and God the Father. Not at all. Uh, that intercession means that as the one who has suffered in the Godhead as a human being, he is fully identified with us in our suffering. That's what an intercessor is, someone who enters in to the experience of the one they're e inter interceding for. Jesus fully identifies with us in our suffering, and even though his suffering here on earth is over, he's still suffering up in heaven with his children. That's what an intercessor does. As long as there's sin on this earth, as long as his children suffer, he suffers. So he's suffering with us. That's what it means when it says he lives to make intercession. It doesn't mean that he's some go-between between, between the Father and us, but trying to appease the Father. Nothing could be further from the truth. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. We're one and the same. Philip says, hey, when do we get to see the Father? Um, Jesus says, hey, I and the Father are one. If you've seen me, Philip, you've seen the Father. There, there's no difference. We're all the same. We're on the same page. So this idea that we some, Jesus has to appease the Father is a joke. But, um, you know, the second area that the finished work is a key to is the power and presence of the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I, I love Romans 8, 4 to 11, this great 
passage of what it means to walk in the Spirit. But what we can't afford to do is jump over Romans 8.1. Because Romans 8.1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, to those who are focused in the finished work. There's no condemnation for those who are identified with the finished work and make that their focus. So the successful walk in the Spirit is predicated by the finished work and having our focus in the finished work. And it always makes me nervous when Christians place so much emphasis on the Holy Spirit and the baptism and the gifts that they don't talk about the finished work. The finished work is the basis of everything. It is the power of the Holy Spirit. It can't be separated from the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's what birthed Pentecost was the finished work. When the disciples came into accord on the finished work, Pentecost was birth. Let's look over at Titus 3, 5 to 8 for a moment. Because it really uh, blends these concepts well. Titus 3, 5 to 8. Paul says, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, his finished work, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, through the finished work that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs, his children, according to the promise of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. Now that's interesting that good works comes in here. And, and I've come to the place where whenever I read good works in the New Testament, in the New Covenant, it's God works. That's what it is. It's God works. It's not our works. It's not the works of the flesh. How do we know that? Because it says specifically, Hebrews 4, 9, and 10, that when we're in Christ, when we're identified with him, uh, when we've entered into his rest, our works are all dead. They're no more. When we're in him, we're dead to self. Um, our works are called what? Hebrews 9.14. They're called uh, dead works. They're, they do more harm than good. When, when you're focused in human works, you're focused in the wrong direction. You're, you're at odds with the kingdom rather than letting God's works flow through you. So this passage is saying that justification is based on God's mercy, grace, shed blood, finished work. And so is sanctification. So is the Holy Spirit. There's no difference between the two. They're all focused and based in the perfect, finished work of Christ. And they produce God's works through us. The more we're focused in who God is and what he's done, the more his works begin to flow through us. It has nothing to do with human merit, human credit, human boasting. None of that. It's all about him, all glory to him. Philippians 1, 6. He who has begun a good work in you, again, it's God who does that good work, will bring it to completion the same way, in Christ Jesus, through the finished work. Sanctification is through the finished work just as much as justification is through the finished work. It's all focused in the finished work. Colossians 2, 6. As you've received the Lord Jesus, how did you receive him? Through faith in the finished work through justification. So, you walk in him in the same way. It's through the finished work. Everything is focused in the finished work. It's critical. And then the uh, third key that we get from the finished work that's also very critical and I think important for the church today is the unity and community of the Godhead. And I want you to notice what we've been saying. Um, the finished work is focused in Christ and what he's done. The Father's heart of love is focused in God the Father. The power and presence of the Holy Spirit is focused in the Holy Spirit. 
And then unity and community is focused in the Godhead as a whole. They are the perfect model of unity and community. When you read John 14, 79 that I alluded to, Philip says, show us the Father. Jesus says, hey, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. We're one and the same. There, there's no difference. There's no qualitative difference. We're all about the same thing. He's love and I'm love. You know? I'm not appeasing anything. I'm not trying to deal with any kind of difference between you and the Father. We're all one. We're all on the same page. And the, the Father doesn't even involve himself in judgment. When you read John 5.22, it says the Father has given all judgment to the Son. So this idea that the Father is the big bad judge and the Son is the appeasing intercessor is nonsense. Uh, it says the Father doesn't do any judgment at all. He's given all judgment to the Son. So that if there's any judge in the Trinity, it's the Son. It's not the Father. But again, they're all one. And that's the great final prayer of Jesus, is that we would be one as they are one. John 17, 21. That prayer for unity. You know, when, when we look at the big things in the Christian faith, it starts with the finished work. All things go back to the finished work of Christ. But obviously, God's love for us that flows through us becomes absolutely critical. You know, Jesus says, as you've done it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. That's, that's a very critical part of what it means to be a Christian, how, how we treat people, even those who've mistreated us. Someone said to me last week, uh, how can you let people in the church who've really mistreated you? And I said, well, how can I not do that? You know, that's ridiculous. Isn't that what the word says? Love those who mistreat you. If we don't do that, we're no different than the heathen, the Bible says. You know, we might as well just be a heathen if, if we're not going to try to treat the people who've mistreated us in a loving, caring, restoring manner. But um, Jesus was all about this unity, unity of faith, unity that's all based in the finished work of what God's demonstrated through his perfect act of love on the cross. In Acts 2.1, again, alludes back to this. It says the disciples were all in one accord. And that's not talking about a vehicle, you know. I can still remember as a kid all the jokes. Of what was the first motorcycle in the Bible, you know. Joshua's triumph could be heard throughout the land. And, you know, what was the first car in the Bible? They were all in one accord. No, that's not what it's talking about. Uh, it's talking about that they were all in unity. And what's crucial here to understand is it doesn't mean they were all in uniformity, that they all believed the same thing. No. What it means is that they were all focused and fulfilled in the finished work of Christ. They were coming into the same perspective and understanding. They were on the same page about the finished work of Christ. And that's what we see as the crucial, critical thing throughout the entire New Testament. Everything keeps coming back to this one theme, the finished work of Christ, the perfect work of Christ, in Christ, what Christ has done for us. They were all in one accord in that place. And that's what God's looking for today for his church, to all be in one accord in his finished work and be so focused in his finished work that all these other things begin to flow out of that which is the Father's love and his love flowing through us and you know the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. All this stuff comes out of a true understanding and embracing of the finished work of Christ. The devil's all about confusion and as we close I want to show a little commercial here that I saw this week that uh, struck me as being so typical of what goes on with Valentine's Day and almost every other holiday these days. We'll see if we can uh, pull this up. Just a little 30 second commercial here. We'll see if they can put it on for you. 
Rebecca? You guys are making me wild. You are so average. Are you still listening? So incredibly adequate. Every time I look at you, my heart says, Hey, look, it's Rebecca. She'll do. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that just typical of our commercialized society today that, that love and relationship are equated with material, with how good your gift is, if your flowers are good enough, if you can embarrass the other husbands in the workplace because your flowers are better than theirs or your stuffed animals bigger than theirs. Um, you know, it, it's, you know, he went to Jared, all this stuff. Everything's about how much money people spend on each other. And uh, it's the commercialization of relationship. It's the materialization of love. And it's so nonsensical. It's so untrue. It's so the opposite of who God is. My Bible says, freely you have now. received. Freely you have received. You know, freely give. Uh, God is not a materialist. God does not hold to material standards in his love for us. His love is poured out out of a heart of love and a willingness to give everything of himself for us because he cares about us so much as his children. So Luther did a great thing. It was an awesome thing to apply the merits of Christ's finished work to people's salvation. They needed to hear it. They were desperate to hear it. It caused one of the greatest revivals in history, the Reformation, when they did hear it. But there's still work to do. God is raising up a bride who will go beyond applying the merits of the finished work just to their personal salvation, who will apply it to God's love for us, how that love flows through us, who will apply it to the power of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, who will apply it to interdenominational unity and in coming into a oneness. There's still work to do in the unfinished Reformation.